Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential orchestral fantasies for beginners. What is an orchestral fantasy? Well, there are two ways to look at it. On the one hand, you can look at it as a free-form composition. There's the formal definition, a, a piece that takes a theme or musical item of some kind and then works out a kind of improvisatory, fluid, multifariously, emotionally and expressively charged larger work. That doesn't help very much, does it? But, you know, the idea of fantasy is just that. It means something that's improvised and imaginative and, you know, spur of the moment, off the cuff, no matter how carefully worked out. It has to sound like, like, like somebody is making it up as they go along. That's the sort of formal definition. Then there's the definition of a fantasy, something hallucinatory, something out of your imagination, something that you dream up something that may not be rational. It may not make, you know, perfectly logical sense, but it should take you into another world, another zone, some sort of, you know, have you participate in someone else's, someone else's dream state. It's all of those things. And those are all wonderful. The definition is loose enough so that it's back basically meaningless and composers can do whatever the hell they please. And that, of course, is the, the great joy of the fantasy, whether it's for some, an orchestra or something else. And we're going to be doing them for a couple different instruments. But right now we're talking about the orchestra. And the ultimate first iconic orchestral fantasy is, of course, Berlioz, the Symphony Fantastique, the first ever piece of music that attempts to recreate the hallucinogenic experience of somebody who is on an opium-induced drug trip. And that's what happens. And in his opium-induced drug trip, um, he sees his beloved, who has just dumped him, uh, appearing in different scenes in a ball in the country. And then he murders her and he's getting marched to the scaffold and having his head chopped off. And then after his head's chopped off, the head has a dream when his beloved shows up as a hideous witch at a witch's Sabbath. I mean, we're talking hallucinatory and fantastical. And the Symphony Fantastique is just, you know, I mean, it's just the iconic fantasy type work extraordinary. And it's programmatic. We know what the fantasies are. We don't always. Sometimes the fantasy is more just, I'm using my imagination and you decide what the fantasy is about. So that's number one in our 10. Number two, Vaughn Williams, the Fantasia on a theme of Thomas Tallis for double string orchestra and string quartets and string quartet. Pardon me. This is a cathedral in sound a work of transcendent spirituality and, and unbelievably penetrating beauty and soulfulness. And the fantasy is based on a tune, by a, a hymn tune by Thomas Tallis. It's religious music transmuted into a concert experience. Um, and it has contrasting themes that Vaughan Williams invented himself in the central section. And, you know, why it does what it does? Who knows? It just does and does it perfectly. It's so beautiful. It's one of the most glowing, warm, intense, gorgeous string pieces. And when you hear it for the first time, if you don't know it, and I've talked about it quite a bit, it, it feels like music coming from another world. It really does. It just opens up a whole new oral experience for you. It really does. And so I can't recommend it highly enough. Next, Balakirev Islami, the Oriental fantasy. Now this exists in a couple of versions. The original is for piano solo, and it's you know right up there with some of the most difficult pieces ever written for the piano. This is an Oriental fantasy, you know, the, the mystic land of the Orient, the Far East, the exotic, the you know, the mysterious, you know, all that stuff. It's wonderful. I love all that cultural appropriation that Western composers are so very good at. 
I mean, what matters is not whether they're appropriating. What matters is if they really know what they're doing. And Balakirov really knew what he was doing. Now, Islami has been orchestrated by lots of different people because it just calls out for that kind of treatment. So you'll, you can get it in one of the orchestrations. It doesn't matter whose. Or you can listen to the piano original. Either way, it's an extraordinary, wonderful gem by a composer who was not very prolific and, and whose works, though, really are, are quite fine. I mean, he wrote two really good symphonies and a few other goodies, but Islami is his, probably his masterpiece. And I mean, there's also the tone poems Russia and Tamara, which is another Orientalist sort of fantasy, but they are, they are wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And Islami is the crown jewel in that tradition, that Russian tradition. Next, let's see, who else do we got? Oh, yeah. Instead of a fantasy about the Far East, we have the actual Far East, Ifukube. Now, Ifukube was, is one of the great Japanese 20th century composers. His Symphonic Fantasia No. 1. Now, Symphonic Fantasia No. 1 is based on his music to the Godzilla movies. He actually did those film scores, and he took the music and fashioned it into a series of symphonic works, of which Symphonic Fantasia No. 1 is the most popular. Um, you can actually hear Godzilla stomping on Tokyo. If you know those movies, you'll know Symphonic Fantasia No. 1. And so it's really fun to listen to. I mean, it's really fun if you, if you, know, if you know the monster movies. But um, even if you don't, you'll listen to it and you have a very good sense of what the fantasy is. It's a, it's a horror, science fiction, you know, monster movie fantasy. And the music really lives up to its reputation. It's simply wonderful. Ifukubi is a composer well worth getting to know, by the way. He wrote mostly in a sort of neoclassical, post-Stravinsky and rhythmic, almost minimalist vein. And then a couple more extravagant effusions of which the Symphonic Fantasia number one is definitely one. So after that, well, let's do Richard Strauss, something a little more traditional, Aus Italian from Italy. This is subtitle, subtitle to Symphonic Fantasy. And it is because it deals with, you know, images of the past and then, you know, an imaginary popular festival at the end different scenic bits of, of evoking Italy. And it's, it's a relatively unknown work. It's symphonic in nature. It's like 40 minutes long. It's a big, you know, if, if it didn't have a programmatic title, Strauss would have probably called it a symphony. I mean, it, it, it is that in, 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 in all ways that matter. It really is. I mean, the sequence of movements is a little unusual and whatnot, you know, and it was German. So, you know, German, German things have to be categorized in their proper form or else, you know, the great god of German music will strike you with a bolt of something or other. But wow, it's beautiful. It's such a lovely work and it amazes me that people don't perform it more often. It doesn't require an extravagantly large orchestra, but it's beautifully orchestrated and it's transitional from the early traditional Strauss to the more, more original and, and revolutionary Strauss of the early tone poems. And so I really recommend that you go and listen to Aus Italian. It also has that wonderful tune, Finiculi Finicula, by Luigi Denza, which Strauss stole and stuck in there and got sued by Luigi Denza because Strauss thought it was a folk tune. And when told that it was by Luigi Denza, Strauss said, you mean somebody wrote that? Who the hell is Luigi Denza? Well, he was a vo vocal teacher at the Royal College of Music in London, among other things, and was very much alive. I mean, let's face it, it's a tune that's about a funicular on Mount Vesuvius. It was destroyed in an eruption in 1946, in case you're curious. But there you go. So Strauss's Aus Italian is really, really cool. After that, Bruch, Max Bruch, the Scottish fantasy. Now, fantasies for solo instrument and orchestra are quite common, particularly, it seems, for violin. The violin is a wonderful, fantastical instrument, maybe because it's supposed to be the devil's own instrument. So there's a certain hallucinatory quality about it. The Scottish fantasy is a glorious piece of music. I actually think it's Brooke's best piece for violin and orchestra. I mean, you could argue it's between that and the, and the first violin concerto, but it's, it's, it's concerto length. It's actually longer, I think, than the first violin concerto. It really should be played more frequently as a separate work. 
a solo work, but because it doesn't have the word concerto attached to it, people think it's lightweight and that it doesn't deserve the attention, but it is every bit as fine and formally, formally incredibly successful. And the Scottish tunes are delicious and it's just a great work. Uh, if you don't know it and you know the first violin concerto, you're in for a real treat. You should really give it a listen. You'll find it delightful, particularly if you like, particularly if you like violin concertos and you're looking for something that's a little bit off the beaten path, but, but will we'll, we'll go down the first time you ever hear it very, very easily. Then we have another or symphonic fantasy. Yeah, Tchaikovsky, Francesca da Rimini. Now this is a tone poem. Tchaikovsky called it a symphonic fantasy. Tchaikovsky didn't like the word symphonic poem. You know, Romeo and Juliet was, was an overture, a fantasy overture, you know, something like that. And, and, and this is a symphonic fantasy, but it's a symphonic poem. It tells the story um, of, of Francesca da Rimini, who is, you know, con consigned to the nethermost region of hell because she's caught with her lover. And so you have hell at the beginning and then a beautiful central episode, which is the love scene. And then the lovers are discovered and they are sucked back into the boiling cauldron in which Dante dumped her because she was like Dante's cousin or sister-in-law or was married to one of his relatives. You know, Dante reserved, you know, the uttermost circle of hell for all the people he didn't like in his life. And Francesca was high on the list. She definitely was. This is a very difficult piece to bring off. It has more lousy performances. It has to be played like, I, I did a video on the best recordings of Francesca de Rimini. I suggest you watch it. Or, or as with all of these recommendations, go to classicstoday.com and look at the reviews of these works. There are dozens. I mean, there's uh, tens of thousands of free reviews, literally, for you to look up and, and you can decide which performances you want to try just by looking at the reviews. I mean, that's what that's there for. A lot of you have said, please put recording recommendations with these. It's like, no, you don't have to. I've done a whole website for the past 20 years just to do that for you. So please go have a look. <laughs> You'll, you won't regret it. Anyway, so Francesca da Rimini is definitely a symphonic fantasy, especially since it deals with a supernatural subject. And of course, love, which is always the subject of fantasy, love and hell. I mean, what could be better? Anyway, after that, another symphonic fantasy by Zemlinsky, Die Seejungfrau, The Mermaid. It's, you know, The Little Mermaid. You know the story. I mean, but it's a symphonic poem, a big three movement symphonic poem, a gigantic thing. It was premiered on the same program as Schoenberg's Peleus and Melisande, which you know, it got all the attention because it was in a much more radical symphonic style. It's 40 minutes of chromatic sludge, whereas the Zemlinsky has tunes, really beautiful tunes. In fact, it sounds a lot like Tchaikovsky in places. In fact, it sounds like Francesca de Rimini. And, you know, Francesca de Rimini has that da 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 do 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 after the love tune, that sort of refrain. Well, you hear almost exactly the same thing in, in Die Seejungfrau. Now, Die Seejungfrau comes in a shorter version, a sweet type version. I don't know who did that. And a longer version, which is the one you should get. You should have the whole thing. It's a big, decadent, late romantic, voluptuous, symphonic, fantastical fairy tale. And a fairy tale is, by its very nature, a fantasy. And however you arrange it, whether it's formally very tightly constructed, as this piece actually is, or whether it's just sort of loose and flabby and colorful, who cares? It's a fantasy. And speaking of fantasies, oh my goodness, John Corigliano, Three Hallucinations from Altered States. <laughs> now I've talked about this before. This is another bit of film music. Uh, really, really good film music, like If a Kubis. And, you know, Altered States is a movie about, you know, sensory deprivation being used to send people back in their, to their genetic memory of, of primitive Neanderthalness and stuff like that. And these hallucinations are, 
the very definition of fantasy. They're hallucinatory. It's wild music, extraordinary music with lots of nine timpani and things going crazy. And oh my God, it's exciting. And I remember, I remember a wonderful, wonderful concert where they performed this, I think it was in Washington, D.C., with Rostropovich, actually, in the National Symphony. And it was what we used to call the Blue Hair Concert, you know, the Sunday matinee, where all the old ladies with blue hair, you know, show up. And at the Blue Hair Concerts, you know, they, we, we tended to make them, you know, a little bit more, more uh, conservative because of the audience, but, you know, Rostropovich didn't care, and he did the three elucidations, and I remember sitting next to a couple of the bluest of the blue-haired old ladies, and this thing was going completely ape. I mean, craziness. Was, actually, it's the scene where the guy, they, they think that they're apes or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, it, it's, it's just hair raising. And after it, this lady just turns to me spontaneously and says, wasn't that wonderful? And I said, yeah, go. That's what I developed the first, the kernel of the idea for my video to hell with young people, that old people are not the fusty conservative you know, curmudgeons that class, the classical music industry would have them be. Most of them, in my experience, are totally open to wonderful musical experiences and intriguing and interesting, far-reaching musical experiments because their lives are so damn boring. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it is, folks. And last but not least, the ultimate symphonic fantasia. It's Martinu. Now we've just done concert programs and we talked about Martin New's Sixth Symphony, which is subtitled Symphonic Fantasies. And boy, is this a hallucinatory, hallucinatory work. I mean, it begins with insect noises. The first two movements both begin with insect noises, but they're different insects. You know, one of them is like a cloud of Amazonian insects, whereas the second one is like the humming of a beehive, something like that. Anyway. It, it, it is it is extraordinary music that it's lyrical and exotic and incredibly colorful and it, it's music that absolutely comes from another world a world of dreams Martineau was a composer of dreams you know his his greatest opera Julietta is, is subtitled a dream book it's about it's about a, a, a guy who's he's, he's trapped in his own dream. He's a traveling salesman who goes to a town where people have no memory. And so things repeat themselves in a phantasmagoric progression that makes no sense at all. But it turns out in the third act, which takes place in the Bureau of Dreams, that, that everybody is in, everybody is trapped in their, in their world of dreams. And if they don't wake up, they'll be trapped there forever. And that's what the symphonic fantasy, I mean, that work haunted Martineau and bits of it appear, including in the, in the, in the Sixth Symphony. It's, it's really a remarkable work, this, this symphony. It, it just, it will haunt you, it will really haunt you. And it has that completely, completely spontaneous generation kind of feel. It just happens. And why it works and how it holds together, and it really does, it has some recurring themes in it, but it doesn't matter. It's just one fabulously dreamlike and and sometimes terrifying and sometimes sweetly lyrical and dance-like, but they all take place in this framework of, of, of imagination and hallucination, and it's just extraordinary. So I hope these 10 works will sort of send you off into another world, you know, get, you, get your imagination working in tandem with the music. They are all, one and all, extraordinary pieces. So keep on listening. Friends, thank you so much for joining me. Take care.